Grace, mercy and, peace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, Advent is a season of highway making. Maybe you've never heard that turn of phrase quite that way, but that's really what's going on in the season of Advent, and our gospel gives us a clue into that. Today we read in our gospel text, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. In the 17th century, a Swedish Lutheran named Franz Michael Franzen, he wrote a hymn called Prepare the Royal Highway, and in the first verse of that hymn, here is what he says. Prepare the royal highway, the king of kings is near. Let every hill and valley a level road appear. Then greet the king of glory, foretold in sacred story. Hosanna to the Lord, for he fulfills God's word. This image of highway making helps us understand what John the Baptist is preaching about in our gospel reading in Matthew chapter 3. What exactly does it mean to prepare the way of the Lord and to make his paths straight? Well, I don't know if you've ever been witness to any highway building or road making, but there's a couple of main activities that are involved in that. Because you want the road to be straight, as straight as it can be, because there's not much point to a road that takes you longer to follow to get to your destination than is necessary, and that it is um, level. So the two things that a lot of them have to do when they're making a highway is they have to break down barriers in the form of hills and mountains and rocks and things like that. And they also have to build up valleys. After all, you can't have too steep a grade on going downhill or uphill when you're building a road. So if you've ever been driving in your car on a road, you've probably seen evidence of this breaking down of barriers and maybe you didn't even realize it. So anytime you're driving on a road and you see like next to the road a sheer cliff of rocks, or maybe there's even a sign that says beware falling rocks, that's an indicator that before that road was built there was a mountain or a hill there and they dug it out or they blew it open with dynamite so that they could make a road to go through there. Probably a great example of that for people from Pittsburgh are the tunnels. They made the tunnels so that the road could go through the barrier of the mountains and the hills. And then the other main activity is building up where the road needs building up. So the most obvious form of that is bridges, right? You have to build a bridge over water. But you also have places where roads are built up so that they don't dip really deeply into a valley and that they can be made straight. Now sometimes you can go around these barriers if it's not too big of a hassle, but other times it's impossible. You will delay your road and your trip by many miles and lots of time, and so they need those barriers broken down. Well, in time of the scriptures, the roads were not built all that well. And they weren't well kept. They weren't regularly maintenanced. Now you might argue today that there's some similarities there where um, but there was a, a time when they would fix up the roads, and that was when the king was coming to town. So whenever the king would travel, wherever he was going to go, they would fix up and build up the roads so that they would be level and straight. Well, in the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesied that someone was going to come before the king of kings to make his path prepared and to make it straight and that is John the Baptist in our reading today now clearly John the Baptist is not preparing a literal path or highway for the king he's not digging trenches he's not shoring up berms he's not blasting rock and digging through stone so what exactly is he doing to prepare the way and what is the path that is being referred to in the prophecy well, the preaching in this chapter will give us a clue. The first thing he says is repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is coming, and he's referring to Jesus. 
Then it says that he's baptizing people and they're confessing their sins. It's specifically called a baptism of repentance. And then, of course, he has a special greeting for the Pharisees and Sadducees who come out to see what's going on. He calls them brood of vipers. Very nice, kind words from John the Baptist. Uh, we actually at the seminary, as an aside, had like little awards for the graduating class, and one of them was the award for who was most likely to call their congregation that first. <laughs> Don't worry, I didn't win. Um, but yeah, John doesn't mince words. He's a pretty direct guy. Probably what you would expect from somebody who dresses up in camel's hair and eats locusts and wild honey. He's not going to mince words. And so he talks about the wrath to come and bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. The axe is laid at the root of the trees, and unless you're bearing fruit, the tree will be cut down and thrown into the fire. But then he goes on, he says, I'm baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who's coming after me, he's going to baptize you. He's mightier than I, greater than I, so great I'm not fit to carry his sandals. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then he's going to take his winnowing fork to the threshing floor and separate the wheat from the chaff. And he's going to gather the wheat and he's going to burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. So as we go through John's preaching, it's clear the object, the path, is not a literal one. He's not talking about an actual pathway or highway. The object of his preaching is clearly the human heart. The prideful and arrogant human heart that refused to see its own shortcomings, its own sinfulness, its own wickedness. But John, through God's word, has been tasked with leveling the human heart, with making the way into it straight. Even today, the barrier or the mountain of our spiritual highway, the one that goes into the heart of every believer, there are many things that prevent, many things that make up that barrier to our repentance, just as there were in the day that John is preaching. And repentance doesn't come without hearing God's word, which is why John preaches so authoritatively about the wrath to come and about the need for turning away, for repenting of those things. So he comes heavy with the word of God's law, the part of God's word that we're not unfamiliar with ourselves, the part of God's word that says, You are a sinner, you are worthless. You have no redeeming righteousness or qualities in and of yourselves by which you can be saved. And by itself, is hopeless. But through the agency of the Spirit, through God's Word, opens our eyes to the reality of our situation and prompts us to ask, what then can we do? Boom! The first big blast rings out against the barrier from repentance in the heart of God's people. John the Baptist's voice cries out in the wilderness, repent, for you need to. Confess your sins and be baptized in a baptism of repentance so those barriers may be destroyed. What is your barrier? For the Pharisees and Sadducees, it was clearly that they were prideful in their ability to follow God's law. That they took a lot of comfort in the fact that they were sons of Abraham. And John says, God can make sons of Abraham from these stones. That doesn't make you worthy of God. So like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, are you proud, afraid to admit to yourself and others that you aren't as great as you think you are, that in fact you might be downright sinful and unworthy of the love that God has for you. Maybe you're afraid of the shame of your confession. Maybe you think if it gets out what's really 
behind the mask that I wear, if people really knew the kind of person that I was, no one's going to love me or accept me. Or maybe it's distraction. Maybe you're not repenting because you aren't actually even hearing God's word. You spend most of your life pursuing other things, shutting off the pathway of God's word, will, wisdom, and righteousness by not hearing it. Whatever it is, it's created a barrier that needs to be broken down, and there's only one thing that can do it, the Word of God. And so John is charged to fulfill this prophecy from Isaiah to preach God's Word of repentance, to prepare the way for the King. So in Advent, we too are hearing this Word of God preached to us, read to us so that we can hear it and mark it and learn it and inwardly digest it. Yes, you are sinful. Yes, you are broken. Hopelessly broken in a way that you cannot fix. But yes, it's true that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is coming. Prepare the royal highway, goes out the call. Prepare your heart to receive the king who is coming. Now, with just the law, that reality that the king is coming is one of despair and fear. For I've been told that I'm unworthy to be in his presence, that I'm unworthy of his love, that I've ruined my chances of being in his good graces. And now when he comes, I'm afraid to see him. I don't want to be seen by him. I don't want him to notice me. But John isn't just speaking the word of the law here. He goes on to describe what the king who is coming is here to do and what he intends to give those who hear the word of God and repent. For those who have been awakened through the gift of faith, through hearing God's word, whose eyes and ears have been opened to the real state of their soul. That they're in need of healing, that they're in need of love and repair. Now he starts by saying that the axe is at the root of the trees. In other words, there's going to be a time, a time of judgment where there's no longer time to repent. For when Christ returns as the judge, his winnowing fork is in his hand and the separation of the wheat and the chaff will occur. But there's a phrase in the midst of all of that that highlights the joy, not just the penitent preparation for the arrival of our Savior, but the joy of his coming. Because the coming king is going to build us up where we lack. That pathway to our heart isn't just about breaking down barriers, it's about building us up where things are missing. We have no righteousness of our own. We're incapable of loving God as he loves us. And so the coming king has come to bring you the very things you need in order to shore up that path, to finish the highway into your heart. And he says this by pointing out the baptism by which you will be baptized by this king. You see, John's baptism is just the first part. It's one of repentance the revelation of the law, but John can't do anything about the problem that is highlighted in God's law. Only the king of kings, the one who is coming, has anything to say or do about that. And here's what he says. He says that he is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You see, Jesus, the king of kings, has come to give you a different baptism. A baptism that doesn't just break down the barriers and destroy the old self. He's come to bring a fuller baptism. A baptism that not only kills the old sinful self, but rises to new life, a new creation. A child of God, 
pure and righteous, forgiven and redeemed. By means of his word of gospel promise and the faith granted by the Holy Spirit through hearing that word and receiving it, we are ready. The path has been made straight right into your heart. And the king is coming. He's coming to live there, to live in the midst of each one of us, to make us worthy, to make us righteous, to make us loved by God. Our barriers of pride and shame and being lost or distracted, they're removed. We confess our sins and we plead for mercy. Then the baptism comes. The joyous message of the gospel is given out. The king arrives. In our service on Sundays, the king's first arrival is in those words of absolution. We come broken and beaten up by our own sinful nature. And through hearing God's word and believing in him, we repent of our sins. And the king comes to us with his word of blessed absolution. Dear one, your sins are forgiven because of the king and what he has done. See, fire can destroy, but it also purifies and it makes new. So our king has come to bring us faith. Faith not only that reveals our fallen state, but a faith that reveals what God has come to do about it through the sending of the king of kings for the one who we have prepared the way by sending John to preach a baptism of repentance and then the king himself preaching the blessed message of the gospel, a gospel for sinners, a gospel that destroys the old self, purifies and makes a new creation, a beloved child of God. So, fellow children of God, on the second Sunday of Advent, Today, sing with joy. Prepare the royal highway. And we will clu- we'll close with these words from that hymn. Then greet the king of glory, foretold in sacred story. Hosanna to the Lord, for he fulfills God's word. In the name of Jesus. Amen.